Welcome to Seasons. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We're so excited to start planning for the holidays because it means we get to relax a bit, focus on family, and cook all those comforting favorites that many of us might only think about cooking once a year. You know what we're talking about, turkey. Later in the show, we'll tour Sono 1420 in Norwalk, where the vibe is chill and the artisanal spirits are, well, the reason the vibe is so chill. You'll see. And I get a lesson on making a cozy fall cocktail from one of the managers slash mixologists at Birch Hill Tavern in Glastonbury. But first, let's talk turkey, Plum. In a minute, we'll get some tips from Chef Aaron Ferios. He's a chef in the U.S. Navy, and he's roasted hundreds of turkeys over the years for fellow sailors and their families. Before we get into what it's like cooking hundreds of turkeys, here's what you need to know to cook one turkey for the family for the intimate Thanksgiving or holiday meal you're likely planning right now. Let's start with the very first step, buying a turkey. Now, lots of people head to the grocery store and drop that big old butter ball in the cart. It's easy, it's convenient, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But if you've listened to this show before, you know we're going to suggest that you make friends with a local farmer and cook a fresh turkey this year. You know, Plum, I've never cooked a fresh turkey. Well, it's a little bit different doing a fresh turkey and a, and a turkey from the store, but let's talk turkey from the store first. So if you're going to buy one from the store, it's frozen. That's okay. The key thing is you want to thaw it out for sure. And listen, if you're going to fry it, you have to thaw it out. Talk to me about thawing it out because when do I take it out of the freezer? That thing is heavy. I could severely injure someone if I if I hurled a frozen turkey at somebody. Well, some of those turkeys, the size of them these days, especially those butter balls, you can severely injure yourself just by taking it out of the refrigerator. Just know, so when you take it out, try to take it out two days ahead of time, a day ahead of time, depending on where you want to put it. Like if you're going to take that turkey out and put it in a cooler and just leave it sitting in the garage or <laughs> just leave it sitting outside, it may take... 24 hours, 36 hours to thaw. You know, I've never really known an actual equation to how to thaw it per pound. I'm sure there's some math you can figure out there. Time is definitely not your friend at this. So get it out early as humanly possible. Now you can take that turkey out. You can put it in, like I said, a cooler outside. You can put it uh, in a sink full of water in a pot full of water. Or if you have a five gallon bucket, put it in that. Mm. And as a chef, I've done that. My wife looked at me like I'm crazy. She was, why are you putting that thing in a bucket? But trust me, make sure it's a clean bucket. You've got to use fun. what's available, right? That's it. That's the best you can do. If you completely forget to pull your turkey out and it's Thanksgiving, you can cook the turkey frozen, my son. You what? can. That sounds like culinary blasphemy to me. Uh, listen, you absolutely can. And, but just know that it's going to take a little longer to cook for sure. So get it in the oven. And after about an hour, you should be able to pull those giblets and stuff like that from the inside of it. That's the key. Don't leave that stuff in there. You want to pull that out. So use a pair of tongs, use a glove, something like that to help pull that out of there. Generally, my rule of thumb, it's going to take 50% longer to cook. Is there no fancy algorithm for pound of turkey to minutes in the oven? There is, but the difference is that everybody's oven is different. Mm -hmm. I want folks to get out of the habit of thinking about times when they're cooking. Think about temperature. Temperature is the only surefire way to be correct when cooking your turkey. If you put one of those little thermometers into it, you could buy them at any of the, the big box stores around that has a little thermometer you poke into it and then kind of sits on the outside of the oven. 160 degrees and the fattest part of the turkey. That's what you want to do. I try to go towards that shoulder part near the breast. You have mentioned something about a turkey triangle. What is that? Turkey triangle is the key, right? So people cook their turkeys low and slow. And I'm telling you what, grandma will tell you that's the way to do it. Uh, in my humble opinion, that is not the way to do it. I'm going to fire it super hot, as hot as my oven goes, for about a half an hour to begin with. I want to brown that skin, get it nice and crispy on the outside. But... The trouble is, it's super browned already, so when you go to cook it the rest of the time it has to finish, it's going to uh, start to cook even more and get too crispy. So I make what's called my turkey triangle. So take a piece of foil, fold it in half into a triangle, right? Before mm -hmm. you put your turkey in the oven, now take said triangle or a turkey triangle, mold it across the top breast of the turkey before you put it in the oven. That way you already have the shape of it. Here's why. It's going to keep you from burning your hands. I'll explain. Put your turkey in the oven, 500 degrees, get it started. And then pull your turkey out after it's nice and brown. Once it's brown, take your turkey triangle you made and place that on top of the turkey. Now, if you didn't mold it ahead of time, that turkey's going to be hot and you might hurt yourself. So pop it on there easily, then put it back in there, 350 degrees, and let it go until it's inside a temperature of 160. People are going to listen to this and say, oh, I thought you were supposed to cook poultry to 165. Why is chef saying 160? We have something called carryover cooking. So if you pull a turkey out, it's a big piece of meat at 160 degrees. 
in five minutes, it's going to be 165. So that temperature is going to continue cooking as it's sitting there. So don't be afraid. 160, 161, pull it out of the oven. I know you say different ovens are different, but what is the temperature range in which I should be cooking my bird? Start at 500 degrees, brown it up beautifully, then 350 till it's done. I will say, you'll be very proud of me. I bought a very fancy thermometer. You did? Does it have like a remote probe in it? No, no, no. I'm low tech. It's oh, pink. Okay. I can put it in a little clip and hang on my make believe chef coat. Next time I see you, I'm going to bring it just so you can be proud of me. And it has, yeah, I, would... I push a button and it tells me what temperature it's supposed to be. Wow. It's very, I'm, I'm so ready for Thanksgiving, even though I'm not cooking a turkey because once again, my sister is cooking a turkey this hey, listen, year. Nothing would make me happier than watching you cook a turkey wearing a chef coat. <gasps> I think that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but you know what other thing might have saw we got to think about here this year? You know, listen, sometimes Thanksgiving and the gatherings we would normally have with all of the relatives could be a little bit smaller this year. But that doesn't mean you still can't have a turkey. You can go to your store and just, if it's just a couple of you for turkey dinner, cook a turkey breast. That's all you have to do. You can buy one lobe, two lobes of turkey breast and cook that in the oven and still have your Thanksgiving turkey without having to do the entire giant 30-pound turkey for the entire family. I like that. And don't be afraid, even with that turkey breast, if you're going to do it, to brine it. It's super important. It adds so much flavor. So the whole turkey or the turkey breast, it makes a big difference. Listen, turkey itself, it's a dry meat to begin with. It's boring. I'm sorry, turkeys across the land. You're a boring protein. You're boring, but we still love you. We're going to zhuzh you up. That's right. And the best way to zhuzh it up is and my favorite way to do it is frying it. We started doing this a couple of years ago, and now we can't do it any other way. The deep fried turkey is the greatest thing that's ever been invented. In my world, it goes like this. Ready? Things that I love. My dog, my wife, deep fried turkey, my kids. In that order. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and the wife and turkey can go back and forth. I'm sure. <laughs> well, you know, listen, it's important. Even when you deep fry a turkey, the biggest tip that I can give a human being on this planet when making turkey, let it rest. It's the most important part you can do. Think about it. If you get burned, you tense up. You need time for that tension to kind of relax in those muscles so the juices can flow back through it and it stays moist and juicy. If you cut it while it's all tense after coming out of the oven, it's going to spurt those juices everywhere and be dry as can be. And no one wants a dry turkey. No. Plum, I've never made a fresh turkey. Now's the time to start thinking about it. What do I do? Fresh turkeys are definitely a little bit different than frozen turkeys. Obviously, the clear most obvious benefit to buying a fresh turkey is you don't have to thaw it out. It's already thawed, which is a huge plus because the thawing of the turkey sometimes can create such a stressful environment to begin with. Is the turkey thawed? Is it not thawed? Is it ready? Is it thawed in the center? Who knows? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Ours is fresh. Now, there's a couple of other great benefits to that the fresh turkey, it's going to cook a little bit faster because generally there's more juice, more moisture inside that meat, right? Mm -hmm. That makes for a more even cooking. Also, the flavor is going to be fantastic. Well, I was just going to ask you, if I'm going to make friends with a turkey farmer, I want that heritage turkey that's been having the run of the, the land, eating nuts or whatever else those turkeys eat. Oh, yeah. Those heritage birds are probably the closest thing that we can get to getting a, a, a turkey from the woods that we just hunted. It's called a heritage bird. So if you ask your farmer about a heritage bird, but by the way, they're really hard to come across. They're hard to get. You got to get in there early for those. But the flavor on those is so distinct, so delicious, and sometimes has almost a little bit more of a gamey flavor to it. I think it tastes good. And I think once you have a heritage bird, you can't go back. I mean, there's only one way to go. That's it. Buy your turkey. Thaw your turkey. Brine your turkey roast your turkey, rest your turkey. And turkey triangle your turkey. Everybody looks better with a hat on. Yeah. We hope that was helpful for all of you just starting to think about your holiday meals. Now, let's meet Aaron Firios. He's a culinary specialist first class in the U.S. Navy. Basically, his job for the last eight years has been to cook three meals a day for up to 160 sailors at a time in a teeny, tiny little submarine kitchen. I've been inside of it, trust me. We can only carry about a week's worth of fresh ingredients. So anywhere from fresh spices to lettuce and tomatoes for, you know, that I put out for a salad bar. Once that runs out, I mean, really everything comes out of a can or is dehydrated or is frozen. It's tough. You know, we have to make everything work with the little fresh ingredients or the little, what little good things that we have. We don't get the best food 
on board. It's not like going to the grocery store and being able to pick up something every day. You know, I kind of carry a whole bunch of food on board and each day I write a menu and make sure that I'm using what I have and not using too much food. And it's a very, you know, checks and balances kind of game because we have to watch our food waste pretty closely as well. So your Thanksgiving dinner, you're going to throw down like old school, like you're at home yeah. and you're going to roast some turkeys, I'm guessing. And the, the kitchen space in the sub is very small. Oh, extremely, extremely small. Um, it's basically like, you know, working off of the smallest 1980s kitchen island is about the amount of counter space that I got going on <laughs> for me. <laughs> I will be probably the one that cooks Thanksgiving dinner this go around just because I want to give my guys some time off. They deserve it. So, you know, when we're, when we're out saving the world, you don't really get a day off. I mean, you sleep, basically sleep where you work. I mean, you've been on board. It's not too far away from where you sleep to where the kitchen is. So Nope, especially when you're 10,000 feet underwater. And, and I made that number up. That's not a real number. But I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think once you pass 100 feet, 100, 10,000, it's all the same thing at that point, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's all the same. <laughs> this year, he'll roast multiple turkeys underwater somewhere. In the past years, while stationed in New London, Connecticut, he cooked approximately 250 turkeys every Thanksgiving. That's a lot of turkey. And he prepared dinner with all the trimmings for the Navy veterans and their families. I would do 250 turkeys, 500 pounds of mashed potatoes, 40 gallons of gravy, 2,000 portions of stuffing, 100 pies, 2,500 dinner rolls. Good God. And 300 pounds of squash. <laughs> How does one go about making 250 turkeys? Yes, so I would brine all 250 turkeys oh for God. about for about two days. Anything more than 12 hours is a waste of time. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, that's fine, but it was like all <laughs> I had. All, it was like just me, and I was running around like a turkey with his head cut off, <laughs> un, completely intended. Yeah, so I would brine them, and it would be, you know, by the time I got the first one out, it would be somewhere around – 18 hours and then the, by the time the 250th turkey came out it was like the next day so yeah i hear you and then what i would do is i would package up about 70 of those turkeys to be deep fried oh yeah the rest of the turkeys i would spatchcock them all by hand and then just start roasting them you would take out that backbone essentially right and just make them flat just to expedite the cooking process yeah, so, you know, I did a little trial and error my first time. I left the birds whole, and it took me about seven days to cook 250 turkeys. Oh, and my God. <laughs> because it was taking, like, 12 hours a turkey or something, I started researching and, and just reaching out and doing some – just doing some reading and, and watching some videos and just doing, a, you know, a little bit of professional development. Spatchcocking, I was like, what would the benefits be if I started doing this? And then – I started spatchcocking them and it cut my runtime down in the oven from, you know, a day and a half to I could get 250 turkeys in and out in a day. Science, ladies and gentlemen, when you take that backbone out, essentially what you're doing is allowing more surface area to cook and getting rid of the open space. What that does is allow the heat to be more evenly distributed throughout the bird, which in turn cooks it faster, chef. Your brine, are you dry brining? Are you wet brining? And what's in it? I wet brined my turkeys. It was pretty much just a generic pickling spice. It wasn't anything exciting. I Well, that's actually a great piece of advice for people out there who maybe haven't done a lot of brining in their life. Pickling spice is a great place to start learning how to brine. It's salty to begin with. It's got those aromatics in there. You can definitely get some good flavor in there by using that pickling spice. I'm sure that's what happened with you. It turned out to be great. The people I was cooking for had really, were really uh, impressed with how the flavors came out and everything. So I was like, okay, this is perfect. This is easy for me, and you can get it pretty much at any grocery store. So it was pretty awesome. Yeah, you're, you're a pretty good cook, man. I'm pretty sure you probably had a – you're downplaying yourself, but you, you had a good idea what you were doing. Yeah, I mean, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't want to seem overly cocky. <laughs> a little overly, <laughs> overly spatch cocky. Exactly. No, that's a dad joke. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> hey, so, you know, most of us this year aren't going to have to cook food for 130 sailors or probably for, you know, even 20 people this year with how, you know, the weird world that we live in. But for you, what are like your top three tips for roasting a turkey so it comes out beautiful? We've talked about a couple of things already, but, you know, if you were going to give somebody tips, hey, this is a couple of things you should do that'll make it amazing. My absolute 
top number one would definitely be to spatchcock your bird. That's a good call. A hundred percent. I will never, ever go back to roasting a whole bird ever again. It is by far the juiciest turkey I've ever eaten in my life. I personally really like to slide butter pads in between the skin and the meat. I like that for a crispier skin, nothing like too fried chickeny, crispy style, but definitely like you get that texture and you still are going to maintain some juice in that skin. And it's not like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation Turkey where it pops open and it's just bones and nothing else. <laughs> it makes that sound. Exactly. <laughs> um, and That's two. Give me one more, Chef. The seasoning thing for me, I think, is crucial. I like rosemary, thyme, garlic, salt, pepper. Oh, yeah. I put a little bit of lemon zest in mine. Once you nail down whatever that quintessential Thanksgiving taste is to you, not necessarily like what the world wants, but what you want, what makes you bite into that turkey and go, ah, yes, it's Thanksgiving, I think is definitely very important. What does Thanksgiving taste like to me it could be different than you, but it's a feeling. Like it gives you an emotion. It gives you a feeling that also is part of the flavor, right? Absolutely. And I think that when you get your family or your friends or whomever you have over for a meal, I think if you can evoke that emotion, you've won. You have done exactly what you were supposed to do as, as a home cook, as a chef, as somebody who is experimenting. But I think that emotion is just as important as putting a great product on the plate. I wondered, how will Aaron deliver a memorable Thanksgiving dinner to the sailors he'll be cooking for this holiday? Oh, yeah, and I should mention here, all of Aaron's friends call him Cinnamon. Outside of being with family and my loved ones, my favorite memories have been on board a submarine for Thanksgiving. And I really do think that has to do with the food, too. And you really have to have a good team behind you making that food. I'm excited. You know, as unfortunate as it is to be, you know, away from family and loved ones at this time, I am very excited to be here with my crew and just really give them something that hopefully will taste like home to them. Now, will any of the guys request anything from you? Are they going to say, hey, Cinnamon, can you make me a pumpkin pie? Like, will they give requests? Yeah. So I have opened it up to the, re to the rest of my cooks below me. Like, hey, what do you want? What's going to remind you of home? Because we as the, the chefs on board aren't going to be able to enjoy the Thanksgiving as much as we would want to because you know how it is. We get busy and somebody, you know, the meal, the customer comes first, you know. So I really have implored these guys to be excited about it and tell me what they want. So I'm going to make sweet potato pie, apple pie, lemon pie. We're going to try and do a couple different types of stuffing. Nice. Uh, we're going to do ham and turkey mashed potatoes you know for me growing up down south it was always buttermilk pie look that up and i'm telling you it'll be one of your favorites it's easy all right i'll check it out and the guys would definitely they, they would love buttermilk pie just to be a favor call it chef plum's buttermilk pie when you make it perfect easy day hey listen and obviously the question that is the the most important pertinent question and as a chef i know what your answer is but you know i gotta ask you white meat or dark meat chef dark meat thank you that's uh, I tell them, all my guys are like all right swipe me and i'm mm -hmm. like you guys are wrong you don't know you don't know what's good for you when you roast off that turkey uh you got to show them the oyster muscle okay so if you right by the hip right where that thigh connects to the rest of the body there yep there's a little piece of dark meat there that if you it looks about the size of an oyster if you take it out and you, most people don't even realize it's there. And they'll leave it on the bone when they're doing the carcass. Mm -hmm. But if you cut that little tiny piece out, it's called the oyster muscle. It is the most delicate, delicious piece of meat you'll ever taste in your life. Oh, I'm so excited. Now you got me wanting to go cook turkey. Oh, it's delicious, man. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, chef, we appreciate your time. Seriously, please, 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 God, be safe out there. Just know that I'm thankful for you, and we all are, and we want nothing but the best for you and your entire crew. I know they're lucky to have you on that boat, making sure they're eating good. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. That was my friend, Navy chef Aaron Ferios, AKA Cinnamon. He's cooking a Thanksgiving dinner this year aboard a submarine for a crew of more than a hundred. Happy Thanksgiving, Cinnamon, and thank you for your service. Later on in the hour, I'm gonna get a lesson on making a warm cocktail that evokes autumn coziness and evenings out by the fire pit. And coming up after the break, one of Connecticut's newest distilleries is also its most unique. We visit Sono 1420, a distillery in Norwalk making craft spirits with hemp. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. There are more than a dozen craft spirits distilleries in Connecticut, and one of the newest is Sono 1420. The distillery opened in 2019 in South Norwalk, in case that's not obvious from the name. And their claim to fame is that they make small batch gin, vodka, and whiskey, incorporating the seeds and flowers of the cannabis plant. That's hemp. Wondering what spirits made with hemp taste like? Mixologist Kelsey Devane prepared a tasting flight for me. I'll share that experience in a bit, but first, I toured the distillery with the head distiller, Blake Poon. Blake describes himself as a Trinidadian cocktail nerd, and he gave Plum a lesson on what goes into the stills and how they make the recipe for the spirits, also called the mash or mash bill. You'll hear a bit of science and history in this tour, like when Blake explains where the term navy strength comes from. Here's Blake. We have three stills inside here, one mash tank, two fermentation tanks. So a mash tank is where you would want to have your mash bill. And what a mash bill is, is essentially your recipe for bourbon, whiskey, rye, and whatnot. So okay. like the different grains you would put in whiskey, whether it's corn, rye, wheat, or barley, and your different percentages and whatnot go inside of this tank and ferment. So you add the grains, you add some water, you set it to about 30 degrees Celsius, and it begins to ferment, creating alcohol. This takes about a week. You add yeast, of course, and when this is finished fermenting, you do some distilling. So the yeast actually hang out in there, eat the sugars, and just have a big party, and then all of a sudden they're making alcohol. Exactly, when, they, when the yeast cat doesn't have anything to eat anymore, no parting is over, <laughs> it's time to do some distilling. Wow, interesting, that's very cool. And so then we have the, the mash, then we have the, the stills here. So what happens in these guys? So this little guy here, this is what you call a pot still. So this particular pot still right here holds about, we set it up to about 90 liters of liquid. So say we are doing a run of our gin. We would put equal parts green alcohol, wherever you get your alcohol from. As we were saying, back to the mash tank where you put corn in there and let this corn ferment, you get this alcohol, this raw alcohol. So of course, you cannot put 100% of alcohol in one still. That's just going to create a bomb. So you need to mix this with water. So you put equal parts of this raw alcohol, ethanol, and water, and you essentially heat that up. So it turns into a vapor. You then add fresh water and you cool this vapor in some sort of way, and you, it rains the, de the desired spirit. You hit 212 degrees, that's when liquid turns to gas and it, cre and it goes up, but it can't escape. Well, let's it keep it in Celsius right? because it's all science, you know? Right. So let's say 100 degrees, 100 degrees. water boils that and then alcohol boils at 80. So this mixture, let's say, it begins boiling at about 90 degrees. Alcohol burns off at 80 degrees. That's why there's all these temperature gauges on this machine. So we know when we have gotten enough alcohol out of this 90 liters of solution. The pot itself is you know, silver on the bottom, so that's what holds about 90 liters, you think? Correct. And then the top part... That's where the whole vapor goes yeah. on. So let's start off with the first part of this column. It's what you call a gin basket. Okay. That's where you put your desired botanicals in there. In making gin, you must put juniper berries in there. The primary flavor is the juniper. Right. So you could put juniper in there amongst other flavors. I mean, our name is Sono 1420. You might wonder why the 420 comes about. We do use hemp in our products. And people always ask, so is there CBD or THC in there? We do use a CBD flower, yes. It does look and smell just like cannabis, marijuana, but um, there is no psychoactive or any elements of CBD or THC in our spirits. So our second primary botanical we use was hemp. And I do make three gins. Making three gins with hemp, there's three different types of hemp. There's what you call an Endica, sativa, and hybrid. Endica is calming and relaxing. A sativa is more creative, energetic, and focused. And a hybrid is a balance of those two. What we do is that as all plants have botanicals and terpenes, terpenes are like the aromas we get out of these plants. So each plant has different terpenes. We use terpenes that mimic the characteristics of an indica. So let's say lavender chamomile, lemongrass, all of these have calming, relaxing properties. So we put these 
botanicals in our gin basket and we heat this baby up. And that desired gin is our American style gin called the Midnight. Same process, we do it for the other two. One would be a sativa blend and the other would be a hybrid blend. So what are the botanicals you might put in there with the one that maybe going to give you more energy or be more creative? We use grains of paradise, cuberries, botanicals like these that simulate your cerebro. That particular one is um, Navy Strength, so it's our high proof gin, you know, great for making cocktails and starting your night off. That's the high octane. <laughs> All living in the COVID times. That's right. <laughs> So the big tanks here, same process? So essentially, these are the fermentation tanks. Let's say I start my mash tank up. These tanks is what I would use to transfer what I put that corn to ferment there. I would store them in these tanks so I could just keep producing what alcohol I need. Right, right. So then you can constantly put out new product, right? Correct, correct. So how many different products are you guys putting out right now? So currently, we make eight products. We have two whiskeys, a bourbon and a rye. We have three different styles of gin. One is an American style, which is a little bit more floral, a uh, London dry, a traditional style of gin. And the last one is the bang tail, which is navy strength, high alcohol content. We make three vodkas, so we're scripping away all of those nice botanicals, the hemp flowers, the juniper berries, and we make a basic lemon vodka, blood orange vodka, and lastly, a wee vodka which sounds wood, wood rich and elderflower. I love the creativity involved in doing the whole thing. It's fantastic. You said something a couple times that I got to bring up. You said Navy strength. One of the first types of gin is the Navy strength gin. So you had, let's say, imagine the British Naval Academy or the British Naval gotcha. body. Yeah, gotcha. they are on the these. Navy. Yeah, the British Navy. They are traveling the world. They want alcohol to drink because one, the sea is cool and they left their wives at home. So here they are drinking alcohol. They demanded high alcohol content. So when these gin makers would bring the gin to them in these barrels, they would light it on fire to see if it lit. Now, if it didn't light, that's not considered good enough to make it on the boat. So that's where the whole idea of this Navy strength gin comes from because it's high alcohol content, 114th proof. You understand? Now you know where the term Navy strength comes from. Don't worry, I confirmed with my buddy, Chef Aaron Furios, U.S. Navy sailors aren't allowed to even sip a beer while on duty. We're in good hands. Next up on the tour, I was interested in seeing the barrel room. I learned there are lots of rules when it comes to officially categorizing a spirit as a whiskey. To make bourbon, you need to have at least 51% of the grain corn inside of that mash. To be a rye, vice versa, 51% of that grain rye in your mash. So the grains used are corn, rye, wheat, and barley. I particularly use corn, rye, and hemp seed. I'm not essentially classed as a whiskey because I do use hemp seed in my mash. So because you have hemp seed, you can't be a whiskey? That's what the law is telling me, yes. But I do everything to be a whiskey, to, to be a bourbon, as I should say. I do have 75% corn in my mash, 15% rye, and 10% hemp seed. After I have let this fermentation happen and the distilling process happen, you get a clear white spirit. Then I take this clear white spirit, and to be a bourbon or American whiskey, you must age it in a new American charred oak barrel. And the char inside that barrel kind of helps determine the color and that little has hints of vanilla. A lot of the flavor comes from the char exactly. inside the barrel, right? Correct. So you have different percentages of chars. We use about a 60% char in our barrels. We take this distilled mash and we let it soak up to there between it has to soak there between two to four years and we have barrels around here somewhere right yes i have a loads of barrels pallets of barrels as i should say yeah. do you have some that are full now that we can see yes i have one a, a couple all right i love that let's take a peek now let's take a full whiskey barrels makes me happy or i guess we can't call it whiskey bourbon barrels so i have the full room oh these are beautiful look at these barrels they're amazing how much do these barrels hold so we have a couple different size barrels. I mean, we have these big boys there that I believe uh -huh. hold, what, 52 gallon? And when you look at these barrels, gallon? I mean, just so people understand, I mean, these are barrels. Like you would think of what a barrel would look like. It's, it's really no other way to describe it. You know, it has the metal bands around it, the wood. I mean, it is a barrel barrel. New American Charter, yeah. So I have like a three different size barrels, you know, bourbon and rye. What happens is that the, the idea of barrels is they age at different, processes if I, and of course in a smaller 
barrel, less surface area, it would age fast as opposed to these bigger barrels. They age a little longer, you said, in the bigger barrels. You get a lot more flavor from gotcha. a smaller barrel, as I would say. Okay. Like if you use a 60 liter barrel as opposed to a 250 liter barrel, of course, you'll get more age into your... Right. And so what we do is we blend. We tend to blend and make our particular BBN and rye spirits we pull out to the market. How long will it age inside this barrel? It has to age in this barrel up until two to between two to four years before we could even open it. Years? Yes. Wow. So like this particular barrel in front of you was distilled on um, September 2017. Okay. So this is over three years. Sono 1420 also includes a small manufacturing lab where staff prepare bottles of spirits and hand sanitizer and where large glass jars display botanicals on metal racks along the wall. As a chef, I perked up instantly recognizing bay leaf, caraway seed, cloves, and other fragrant aromatics. I headed into the tasting room next, where mixologist Kelsey Devane set up flights of spirits on their gorgeous 25-foot long wooden bar. If you're wondering what gin, vodka, and bourbon made with hemp seeds and flowers taste like, stay with me for this. This is the fun part. That's right. Come on, this is where the magic happens, right here. So. Like we said, we've got these awesome tasting boards set up, and I have provided for you the full flight of all eight of our spirits, so I hope you're ready for that. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. Is there a spit bucket? <laughs> I'm kidding. Not allowed. Not allowed here. No, no. So we're going to start with the gins today. So we're going to start with the Midnight Gin, okay. which is going to be the Indica, very relaxing, yeah. light, easy, drinkable gin. So I'm going to stick my nose in it because... As a wine snob and beer snob, and that's, that's what they teach you to do. So give it a whiff. So lots of juniper notes. Of course, it's gin. You should get that. It's not the crazy alcohol to your nose right away when you smell. You know, you know what I'm talking about Correct. when you smell like a, a strong gin or something like that. Even an expensive gin, you get that alcohol right to your nose. Correct. The hemp botanicals definitely mellow out a lot of the alcohol pungency. Very cool. Let me take a little taste of this. Here's what I'm getting when I taste that. I almost get like a cinnamon thing going on. Is that right? It's correct. Uh, you could tell when I made this sound like that. I'm pulling a little air in to help aerate to get some more flavor going on. The burn isn't as bad. Everyone knows when I say the, the burn. Yeah. But the cinnamon really kind of comes through there. I'm surprised that's what I'm tasting. The juniper isn't killing me. This is great. Yeah, you definitely get more of a spice than a burn. Yeah. Good. All right, what do we got here? What's the next one? So the next one is our Sky Sail. So that one is going to be the one with a little bit more of those kind of, we'll use the word uppers, botanicals. Yeah, more creativity, right? Yeah, exactly. More creativity. That one's going to taste like, that's going to rem really remind you of a traditional gin. Okay. So let me stick my nose in this guy. You know, so I smell this too. I'm not getting that strong cinnamon thing now, which I think is stuck on my palate from tasting the other one, but... A little more gin flavored, a little more juniper flavors in this. Mm -hmm. That's the traditional New London style gin. Okay. That's a really smooth gin. Juniper, not crazy strong in it. I think I, I keep saying that because to me, juniper, I don't like the flavor of juniper, but it's not really coming through here very much at all. And I love that. I mean, you can taste the juniper in it because it's gin, but you know, definitely a little spice, almost a little... I don't know, it tastes fallish to me. Is that yeah, weird? Yeah, it's, it's definitely got a little bit more citrus than the first That's one. It. Yeah. Yep, so you're, you're definitely going to get that on the nose, and then it's going to have a mellower mm. finish than a traditional New London style, just, again, with the hemp kind of mellowing out that kind of kick. That is delicious. I'm glad you enjoy it. All right, so we're moving on to the final gin. This is the bang tail. Okay. This is the navy strength. This oh, one geez. is going to give you, yeah, I, I started you off light. I'm, I'm graduating you now. Hey, what are the proofs of those first two sure, we Sure, yeah, I was actually going to say that. So traditional gin is about 90 proof. Okay. And then once you get into navy strength, it's 114. Okay, so generally the proof, to figure out the alcohol percentage roughly, you just cut the proof in half. Exactly. So you're looking at 45% to 1,000%. <laughs> right? It's, it's math over 100. I can't do it. All right, so let me smell this. Let me put this in my nose. This is the Navy Strength one, correct? Correct. The bang tail. All right. Yes, and it'll definitely give you a good bang. Oh boy. Wow. Okay. So I smell that and it smells like, I'm getting those floral notes. Mm -hmm. Not as much citrus on this one at all. Correct. If any. This, my cinnamon's gone. Completely. <laughs> I like cinnamon. Let me give it a go. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Wow. So a little bit more of a gin than I would think of. Almost like a, like a mocha undertone situation. I know it sounds kind of, it's kind of in the back. Yeah, it's interesting. 
It's almost like a cocoa, not like a sweet cocoa. That might just be some of the nutty terpenes that we've added to the bank too. Yeah, it's 100% like I'm getting like a mocha thing. Aside from the mocha undertone, Sono 1420's Bangtail Gin had a rich mouthfeel. It was wild for a gin. Now for the flavored vodkas. I started with the lemon. You get those great lemon notes in there, almost like a lemony oil situation kind of going on in your mouth. That mixed with a little bit of soda water, a lemon wedge. I mean, that's a great drink right there. Absolutely. And what we pride ourselves on is that it, there's nothing artificial. So we're using real lemon yeah. rinds. And, that's, and we do the same thing for the blood orange, which is going to be up next for you. And that's where the flavor comes from, from those rinds. It's the, it's the oils that are in there. As a chef, we use the zest from it. Absolutely. And that's where those, that flavor comes from. So this is the blood orange vodka, right? This is the one that people love the most. Yes. This is the biggest. It's really 50-50, lemon mm. and blood orange. People love that. The blood orange comes through really nice on that. It's not overpowering. The same thing. I'd put that over soda, a little, little club soda and some exactly. ice. I'm good to go. That's fantastic. Very easy. Yeah, that's great. And then the last of our vodkas here is the wheat, the woodruff, and elderflower. So this okay. one's stripped of citrus flavors. You're just going to get a very nice hemp flavor on the finish. Okay. You're going to smell the botanicals on the nose. And then, again, it's going to taste pretty hempy on the end. How would you describe hemp? I think it's an interesting flavor. How would so, you describe that? I think it's funny. A lot of people come in here, and when they taste that, they say, it almost tastes like I just took a hit off of a joint <laughs> when they finish, which is interesting. I'm like, okay, it's the same botanicals, but they're like, but that's the taste that I have in my mouth, it's, it, it, which is pretty funny. I wouldn't know anything about that. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. It's very earthy. Yes. You know, you get a very earthy texture, to, uh, undertone to it, almost like, Absolutely. A, like a soil, like a... Uh, very granola crunchy kind of vodka. <laughs> there is a granola thing going on. I almost get like a wet asphalt after rain situation kind oh, of going on. I love out. that picture. You know, that's kind of what I feel. You know what I mean? Yeah. How that's, you know, after a fresh rain, that's kind of what I'm getting off of that <laughs> when I taste it. That's interesting. Great. Woo. After a palate cleanser, I tasted the distillery's two whiskeys. The first was a bourbon spirit they call BBN. It was one smooth bourbon. Oh, wow. The nose on this, the caramel notes, vanilla. I mean, the color of this, too, just it makes me happy. It's a so light, rich. kind of a golden light yes. brown. How long is this barrel aged for? Two years. Two years, this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me get in here and get some of this. That is one of the smoothest bourbons I've ever tasted. A little smoky undertones to it. Yep, that will be the char from the inside of the uh -huh. barrel. That's what you'll pick up on that for sure. Does this have hemp in it as well? Yes, it does, 10%. Mm. And that's what really cuts, again, wow. the bite. In my personal opinion, the rye is even smoother. So if you think okay. the bourbon is smooth, I'm excited for you to try the rye because in my opinion, the rye has even more of a very easy drinkability. Well, you talked me into it. Let's give it a go here. Dive in. Uh, to my nose when I'm smelling it. Not quite the uh, notes of caramel that the other one has with the vanilla notes. It's not licorice. That's the wrong word. Hey, let, me, let me get in here and figure it out. It almost has a a low profile sweetness yeah. that you wouldn't expect from rye also. Rye is I always think of as a little bit harsher than mm -hmm. a bourbon, mm -hmm. um, a little bit less, I guess, upscale than a bourbon, I guess you could say. Everyone's obsessed with bourbon. You know, right. There's all of these major brands of bourbon, um, but rye isn't really dived into as much at the upscale level. And so when it comes to our rye, we really pride ourselves on the fact that people are so turned on to it. They're like, wow, you just put me on rye. Who would have thought? Right. And you know that, that's interesting because you're right. Rye is a very, very, you know, I don't want to say trendy, but it kind of is a thing right now. And Absolutely. That's fantastic. I'm not sure which one I like better on that, but. I go back and forth. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what a fun tasting. Look at this. How are you feeling? That's a big I'm question. Good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Come on. I'm 250 pounds of twisted steel sex appeal. I got this. I'm good to go. <laughs> that one sip of bourbon has my 130 pound butt feeling good right now. No, this is fantastic. Such a fun taste. And you got to come down here and try this, guys. This stuff is so fun. Huge thanks to Kelsey Devane, a mixologist at Sono 1420 for that spirits tasting. Thanks also to head distiller Blake Poon for the tour. The distillery is open for socially distanced tastings Friday through Sunday. Visit Sono 1420 to book yours. If a warm cocktail is more your thing these days, don't go anywhere. After the break, Jessica Cody of Birchill Tavern in Glastonbury walks me through a cozy autumnal reviver. She makes it with another local spirit you may have heard of, the maple bourbon from Litchfield Distillery. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Autumn in a glass, coming up next. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Seasons. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Now it's my turn to experience some really great cocktails. In this segment, I'm turning to Jessica Cody of Birchill Tavern in Glastonbury. She was recently featured in Connecticut Food and Farm, the online magazine created by Winter Kaplinson, a photographer and founder of the Coventry Regional Farmers Market. I asked Jessica to walk me through making one of those vanilla cocktails featured in the magazine, the Autumnal Reviver. But first, I wanted to know about her work and her ideas about what flavors go into a great fall cocktail. I love fall and I love fall flavors and Litchfield Distillery was nice enough to donate some spirits and Winter did some infusions with their product and we turned that into cocktails going forward. Despite being the assistant general manager, I, I understand I can find you behind the bar yeah. at Birch Hill Tavern. So when you think of autumnal flavors or cocktails, what do you think of? Because I'll be honest, if I hear one more pumpkin spice thing, <laughs> I might lose my mind. I see it in Cheerios, coffee. I feel like I see it in dog food next. I mean, right? It's everywhere. Please, <laughs> please tell me there's something new on the horizon. <laughs> yeah. So I think of fall in New England, which, you know, a lot of people do go to pumpkin right away. But I think of um, immediately my mind kind of goes to figs obviously apples, you know, that kind of spicier flavor that you get. And I also wanted to kind of connect the vanilla aspect, you know, and what vanilla goes good with. So like pomegranates came to mind, fig flavors, blood oranges, things like that. You went to figs and pomegranates. I completely wouldn't have thought of that at all, yeah. but that makes complete sense. So when you're scaring up these cocktails and you're doing all these flavor pairings, how do you know they're going to taste good together? Walk me through that. Because I imagine there's like a spittoon somewhere where you take a sip and you're like, no, nope, that nope. didn't work. Yeah, and honestly, <laughs> like a lot of things don't work sometimes. So it's fun when you make a connection with such a small restaurant community and there's so many bartenders and a lot of the reps for the liquor companies are great. So you kind of bounce ideas off of each other. And I think over the years, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, you kind of figure out what flavors work and what don't. And as time goes on, you kind of get a little crazy. You want to like push the envelope a little bit and maybe add some new things. Things. So you see like a ingredients of peppercorns because some flavors bring out the spice in something or, you know, kind of make it a little more cohesive and well-rounded acid and heat in those flavors. Like when you see shows like that, or people talk about that, you know, that can also be added to a balance in cocktails. Samin Nostrat is our patron saint. I mean, we, we <laughs> <laughs> salt, fat, acid, heat. I get That's it. right. That's right. <laughs> Talk to me about what you do with these flavors. What did you do with this fig? Did it eventually make its way into the cocktail that I want to ask you about, which is the autumnal reviver? It did. You know, the Demerara syrup, which is kind of a, you're going to get like toffee notes from using that rather than using like a, a white sugar or something like that. So it's going to lend itself to those flavors of vanilla and figs. So what I did was I basically steeped dried figs, or you can use fresh, but the dried kind of give it that more earthy flavor and like that brown sugar and the vanilla. So you kind of steep it and make a simple syrup, almost like you were steeping a tea. Hmm. But you can add simple syrup to any kind of fruit, basically. And so we made a simple syrup with the fig. And then we added the peppercorns to it to mm -hmm. kind of bring a little spicier note to it to bring out some flavors in the bourbon, which is the other ingredient in the drink. So you make your Demerara simple syrup and then mm -hmm. you store it in the refrigerator. Yep. You strain it out and store it. That can last for a few weeks. It keeps so you can keep using it in your cocktails. So it's kind of nice to have those things sitting in the fridge if you'd like to play around with cocktails at home. It's no wonder that our lexicon changed from barkeep or bartender to mixologist because you really, you find all these really different interesting flavors that I think mere mortals like me would never think to put together. Right. How do you come up with these recipes? It's a lot of trial and error. And I think um, I got my start as a bar manager at Kathy's restaurant in Manchester. And that was a fine dining Italian and French restaurant. And I kind of learned there, you know, this balance of flavors and using seasonal ingredients. So things would come in from the farms. And that's where you kind of play around with like juicing and making syrups and using dried ingredients. So you know, that's kind of where I, I really started to play around with those flavor profiles. And so coming into Birch Hill, you know, it's a natural progression and, and we still use farms and local ingredients there. And so that's kind of how you develop the flavor. So you kind of start out with one thing 
you know, you're like, oh, I want to use figs today. And then you kind of test that out with maybe different liqueurs and liquors and, you know, see how that balances in each drink. And like I said, there's a lot of tossing to the side, but, (laughs) you know, some things do work and, you know, are like, oh, that's a winner. So, yeah. And I think you also start out with, you know, there's a set base of spirits that you use that you kind of go to that, you know, that equation works like a Manhattan or an old fashioned. So a lot of times you're riffing off of those classic cocktails to make something new. The original Autumnal Reviver cocktail is chilled, but a light snow was actually falling when we talked on Zoom. So Jessica shared a warm version. You're going to take two ounces of your preferred bourbon or rye, if you'd like, Mm -hmm. put that in the glass. And then if you want to do the fig syrup at home, you can get fresh figs, you can get dried figs. So I'd probably put 10 figs, equal parts of the Demerara sugar and water, and just kind of let that reduce into a simmer. And you strain that out and chill it in your fridge. And so in the cocktail, you would do the bourbon, and then you're going to do, you know, depending on the sweetness level, just maybe about a half an ounce of the fig syrup, because it's going to be on the sweeter side. And then to the side, you can warm up your apple cider, which is really fun. And if you want to bring that up a notch. You could always throw a cinnamon stick or a clove in there to bring out those flavors. And then you would just pour it right into the cocktail. And it's almost kind of like a hot toddy um, type of thing. So it's really warming and you're going to get all those flavors in the cocktail. It sounds delicious. Yeah. Do I need to do anything since my Demerara syrup was in the refrigerator and now I'm doing a warm cider? I mean, you could warm it up, you know, if you bring your apple cider to a tea type temperature that you would use at home, that would be perfect. It's going to dissolve that sugar. It's not going to be like a heavy honey or anything that really needs to hit the hot water and dissolve. It's going to kind of dissipate and warm up on its own. And if you wanted to do a cocktail less sweet, you know, if the apple cider was a little too sweet for you, you could always do like a take on a hot toddy with it too and use a tea or some kind of um, seasonal tea vibe and put the sugar in and the bourbon and kind of have more like a toddy. Mm. In this original recipe, there's balsamic vinegar Mm -hmm. and orange bitters. Is that just a riff? Yeah. Um, The balsamic, I don't think would lend itself to the hot drink as well, but I think the bitters is also a nice additive to the drink. The, The acid from the vinegar kind of brings out some interesting flavors and the sweetness of the figs and the apple cider. So it just adds a little, just a little scotch. So you're only just doing a drop. Yeah. A little scotch. <laughs> I little like scotch. that. <laughs> <laughs> I love this autumnal reviver. I like that it's, it's warm, especially as it's getting cooler. Are there any other tricks that you have for us where we can maybe take our favorite cocktail and turn it into a warm-ish cocktail? Like I said, the toddies are always a good place to start where you can use like your favorite tea. You can use gin, you can use bourbon with some local honey, which is really nice Mm -hmm. and also kind of medicinal this time of year. Agave, nectar, always work in those warm cocktails. So play with that. I love it. I can't wait. I can't wait to taste one. I'm going to attempt to make this at home. Yeah. (laughs) But can I have you on speed dial? Of course. um, This may be a disaster. (laughs) No, absolutely. (laughs) Thanks, Jessica. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you picking up the article and, and finding interest in it. So thank you. That was Jessica Cody. She's a mixologist and a manager at Birch Hill Tavern in Glastonbury. She adapted her autumnal reviver cocktail for us. You'll find the recipe on our site at ctpublic.org slash seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Seasoned is produced by Robin Doyen Aiken and Katie Talarski. We'll be back next week with pie recipes for the holidays. I love pie. Thanks for listening.